Good morning. Happy Sabbath. It's good to be with you again today. We're excited to uh, do our study. This is lesson four, and it's about Jesus as our brother. And it's going to be an interesting uh, lesson. I'm very excited about it today. And so with me today, we have Scott and Wayne. And Wayne, would you open in prayer for us? So we bow our heads in prayer. Our Father, our God, we thank you so much for the opportunity to worship on this wonderful, beautiful Sabbath morning, for an opportunity to open your word, and an opportunity to, for you to, uh, by, the hope, by way of the Holy Spirit, to help us understand and discern what you would have us to know. I pray, Lord, that you be with all of us in a special way, and all of us at home, that we can see what you would have us to know today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 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 Thank you. So our memory verse today comes to us from Hebrews 2.14. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had power over death. That is the devil. And I don't know about everyone else, but I've had to deal with a lot of death recently. And so I will be very excited for that day to come when Christ um, puts an end to all this death. But what we're going to do is look at uh, some of the components. The, the, the whole issue with Christ as our king, as all the different roles he plays is, is just amazing. And sometimes it takes me a while to get my head around all of it. But we're going to take a look at that today in, in Hebrews. So, for example, in Hebrews 1, Christ was superior to the angels. Hebrews 1, 6 says, But when he again brings the firstborn to the world, he says, Let all the angels worship him. And so we know that he was superior to the angels, or is superior to the angels, and he was worshipped. Yet, what he does is so opposite of, of being king. In Hebrews 2, he's inferior to the angels, or at least for a certain time he is. So we see this in Hebrews 2.9. We, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. So... <clears throat> When he came to this earth, he became human and became lower than the angels. And let's look at another comparison. Hebrews 1. Christ is close to God. In fact, he's at his right hand. We see in Hebrews 8, 1, 8, and 13. But he says, Son, he, he says, O throne of God is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of your kingdom. But to which the angels have said, sit at my right hand, tell your enemies are your footstool. And so we see that Christ here is, sits at the right hand of God and is close to God. But then in Hebrews 2, we also see that Christ is close to us and not ashamed of us. Hebrews 2.11 says, for both he who sanctified and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. So we see this contrasting uh, pre-incarnate Christ and Christ with the human nature. And so he adopted flesh and blood in order to be like us. He also died as we humans do. The, but the big difference is between our death and his is that his death accomplished what our death never could. His death freed all who our lives were held in slavery by fear and death. Hebrews 2.15 says, And release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. And then Christ is like us, but different. He is truly human, yet without sin. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted like as we are, and yet without sin. 
So like Moses, he also chose to um, give up fame. And we see that in 1125, choosing rather to suffer affliction for the people of God rather than enjoy the passing of sinful pleasures. So Christ despised the shame of becoming human and dying on the cross, but accepted it anyway. And it was a humiliating death by any standard. He became like us so that we might become like him. And in becoming like him, he is not ashamed to call us his brethren, even when we might put him to open shame. We see that in Hebrews 6.6. 6. If they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to shame. So even though we fall, even so we put Christ to shame, he still renews us and forgives us. So humans go through trials and testing which produce endurance and finally a maturity of character. Paul describes Jesus in a similar manner. He learned obedience through what he suffered and was made perfect. Hebrews 5, 8, and 9 says, He was a son, yet he learned obedience by things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of our eternal salvation to all those who obey him. So how did Jesus learn obedience? At some point, was he disobedient? The Bible doesn't say he was. The notion would be contradict what's in Hebrews 4.15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we were without sin. Which says he was tested in every way. So he was tested just like we are, but yet he was without sin. So um, Ellen, in the, Ellen White writes in the commentary, in the uh, SDA Bible commentary, Christ was tempted in all points, like as man was tempted. Yet he is called that holy thing. It is a mystery that is left unexplained to mortals, that Christ could be tempted in all points as we are and yet be without sin. The incarnation of Christ has ever been and will ever remain a mystery. That which is revealed is for us and for our children. Let every human being be warned from the ground of making Christ altogether human, such as such and one as ourselves, for it cannot be. The exact time when, he, <clears throat> when humility blended with divinity, it is not necessary for us to know. We are to keep our feet on the rock of Christ as God revealed in humanity. So it's a mystery to us, and maybe that's part of the reason we struggle getting our head around how he could do, be, be all things, but he is. So in summary, the presentation of Jesus as a faithful, merciful brother is depicted in the description of the Son as the ultimate manifestation of the eternal creator, God. And we see that in Hebrews 1, 1 through 4. God, who at various times in way spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets has in the la these last days spoken to us by his son whom he has appointed heir of all things through whom also he has made the worlds who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins sat down at the right hand of the mystery on high, having become so much better than the angels, he has, by inheritance, obtained a more excellent name than they. So we see, as, as we're going to go through this lesson today, we're focusing on Jesus as our brother, but Jesus is also our Savior and our Redeemer. So we're going to move to Sunday now. Brother is Redeemer. Wayne, do you want to share that? Thank you so much, Barbara, for that uh, opening presentation on Sabbath afternoon. That was really uh, exciting. I will be talking about Sunday's lesson. Uh, the title of Sunday's lesson is The Brother as a Redeemer. So when I was going through this this week, this was so exciting to me because I never had a brother. 
And I've had, I have three older sisters. I always wanted a brother. I dreamed about having a brother, but never, never, obviously never had a brother. So this really resonated with me. I want to posit something to you all this morning. Many of us have been in the store forever 21. Uh, many of us can identify with being 21. At one time in our life, uh, for those of us that are older than 21, uh, we remember being 21. And 21 was a uh, was considered a perfect time, a time where you're the perfect weight, uh, maybe uh, the perfect, uh, the perfect uh, length of hair, um, the perfect strength. Uh, so when I think about being 21 again, I think that's when things were like perfect for me. That was, that was when things were the best for things, how things were going for me in, in my life at the time. Uh, my wife and I were in the store the other day, and I remember the, my ideal weight when I was 21 years old. And I couldn't fit some of the things that I used to fit when I was 21. And so when we think about this, when, about, getting, about, about things being perfect, how can we get back to that? And so when we think about Sunday's lesson, the, the brother as a redeemer, what are we being redeemed uh, back to? The idea is to get back to something that human beings used to have. So when we think of this, this redeemer, the idea is to bring us back to something that we used to have. The first thing I want to point out to, to us on Sunday's lesson is this, that we're in need of redemption. So when we think about redeem, a, a redeemer, there's no way that we can accept a redeemer unless we understand that we actually are in need of redeemer, that the person that we look at in the mirror is in need of a savior, in need of a redeemer, in need to get back to that perfect state. And so we're going to look at a few texts here. So Leviticus chapter 25. Leviticus chapter 25, and we're going to look at verses 25 to 27. This is so beautiful because we can see the harmony of the Gospels here, um, even in the Old Testament where we can see um, the salvation of Jesus, the forgiveness of Jesus, and the redemption of Jesus. So let's look at these a couple of verses here. It says here in verse 25, If thy brother, and this is the New King James Version, If thy brother be waxen poor and hath sold away some of his possession, and if any of his kin come to redeem it, then shall he redeem that which his brother sold. And if the man hath none to redeem it, and himself be able to redeem it, to redeem it, verse 27, then let him commit the years of the sale thereof and restore the overplus unto the man to whom he sold it, that he may return unto his possession. And so what is the Bible telling us here? What the Bible is telling us here, when we look at the Jewish economy, um, that was 50 years so if a person was so poor and they had to sell uh, some of their possessions, they could reclaim it during the year of Jubilee, but that was every 50 years. And so when we look at this reclaiming of getting back to, uh, reclaiming their possession, or if they were a slave, they would be freed uh, after that 50-year period. But that's quite a bit of uh, time that would, that would go by. So I want us to look at another way of re another idea of redemption. So let's look at verses 47 to 49. Here's what the Bible says. In verse 47 it says, And if a sojourner or stranger wax rich by thee, and thy brother, and thy brother that dwelleth by him wax poor, and sell himself unto the stranger or sojourner by thee, or the stock of the stranger's family, after that he is sold, he may rede be redeemed again one of his brethren may redeem him. So when you look at this brethren, this is a kinsman, one of his family members may redeem him. Either his uncle or his uncle's son may redeem him, or any that is nigh of kin. In other words, any, uh, any kinsman or any family member that was the closest to him. Unto him of his family may, re may redeem him, or if he be able, may redeem himself. And so when we look at this, we can look at this, this kinsman redeemer. And so we want to look at who is this kinsman redeemer. Let's look at Hebrews chapter uh, 2, and we're going to look at verse 14 really quickly. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. 
Here's what it says. For, for as much then as children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part in the same, that though death might, be, might destroy him, that had the power of death, that is the devil. Verse 15. And deliver them and deliver them who through fear of death were all their, their lifetime subject to the bondage. So we were subject to, we were subject to be slaves um, through sin. But we learn here in verse, we learn here in verse, uh, in, verse in, uh, in Hebrews, we learn that Jesus is the one that redeemed us. In verse 16, for verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. So Jesus took on our character. He took on our flesh. He took on our mistakes. And as this kinsman, this brother, as redeemer, this kinsman redeemer, which is what the Bible describes Jesus as, he was able to redeem us. The lesson brings this out that I want to make sure that you all are aware of. Fifty years was a long time to wait. However, that's why the law of Moses also stipulated that the, that the nearest relative could pay the part that was still owed and thus ransom his relative much sooner. Much sooner. Could ransom his relative much sooner. The reason why I want to home in on that is because when we think about this much sooner, this ransom, that we, when we wait for Jesus to come back, it is by faith, if we accept Jesus, if we accept what he's done for us, he can ransom, he can ransom us much sooner. A final thought I want to leave with you. Closer than father, mother, brother, friend, or lover, the Lord, our Savior, is our Redeemer. Closer than a spouse, closer than any relative, closer to any child that we might have for those of us that have children. Jesus wants to be that person. And we read that through the Desire of Ages chapter, page, uh, page 327. And so now we will go to Sunday's lesson. We will. Or Monday's lesson. Talk about, every time you talk about kinsman redeemer, it makes me think of Ruth and Boaz and, the, and Naomi and Absolutely. how Boaz took care of them as the kinsman redeemer. All right, Scott, let's move to uh, not ashamed to call them brother. Is that where you're at? That's where yes. we're at. Okay. So Monday's lesson, not ashamed to call them brothers. Um, if we think about it, that's really an amazing privilege that um, Christ gives us to be called his own brothers. Um, I mean, even today, people of importance, such as the Pope, they call themselves the Holy Father, but they, th he doesn't call himself our brother or, uh, most of the time. So, whereas like here within the church, we call each other brother, but we, we're really roughly on the same level, whereas Christ was not at all on the same level as humanity. Um, so it, it, you, you mentioned, Wayne, that you thought about not having a brother. So I thought about one thing that my brother said to me many years later. So he's like, when, when we were teenagers, you weren't uh, ashamed to take me around your friend, even though I was like four years younger. So he mentioned that as a, as a positive thing that... Um, and then basically I felt like he kind of returned the fr favor. So later on, he's kind of included me in his groups of friends. So um, anyway, it brought that association as well. So let's look at some of the verses that are here. Um, so it starts off with talking about um, Hebrews chapter 2. And I'm going to back up to 10 and read 10 to 12. For it was fitting for him for whom are all things and by whom are all things um, in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified 
are of one, are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare your name to uh, I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. I will sing praise to you. So this this is highlighting that point that Christ was not ashamed to call us brethren, even though he was one with God, the God of the universe. Um, and then um, the lesson also p talks about Moses' example. So Moses was in line to be the next Pharaoh of Egypt. So he was the son of Pharaoh's daughter. But besides his uh, adopted son of the Pharaoh, he was also a mighty um, military leader. So it says um, he received the highest military and a civil and military training and became a remarkable character. Stephen, the martyr, that is, says of Moses that he was mighty in words and in deed, deeds. And Ellen White adds that he was a favorite with the armies of Egypt. And that Pharaoh had determined to make his adopted grandson his successor on the throne. Yet Moses abandoned all of this privilege when he chose to identify himself with the Israelites, a slave nation without education and power. So, and then this point is made here in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 24 to 26. <clears throat> By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he looked to the reward. Uh, so although at the time it must have seemed like a huge sacrifice to Moses to be associated with a slave nation like Israel instead of becoming the ruler of the most powerful empire in the then known world, Yet by making this choice, he far surpassed any pharaoh in fame, in wealth, and in uh, being bestowed the privilege of immortality sooner than any other human save Enoch. Um, he was also granted the special favor that um, God himself spoke to him face to face. And God himself made this point to Miriam and Aaron. He said, uh, that uh, even though Moses, I mean, the Aaron and Miriam had the prophetic gift, he's like, you should be afraid to speak against my servant Moses to whom I speak face to face. Um, and then Christ took this point and magnified it and says, uh, this is Matthew 10, 32 to 33. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him will I also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him will I also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Um, so uh, Christ takes this very seriously, and so it, it seems like it's easy to honor Christ when Christ was being honored on earth. For example, when he went into the Jerusalem and the triumphal entry, everybody was wanting to honor Christ. But at the time when he was being arrested and um, being tried in um, Caiaphas's palace, at that point, all his disciples were afraid to be associated with him, and including Peter, who had been the most um, ardent in denying that he would that he would ever deny Christ. But Christ had told him before the cock crows thri um, twice, you shall deny me thrice. So, and that's exactly what happened with Peter. Once, once Christ was um, arrested, he, um, he basically put Christ to an open shame by saying, I don't know him. And, and this is part of what it says here in our lesson. It says, um, 
This was part of the problem for the readers of Hebrews. After suffering persecution and rejection, many of them began to feel ashamed of Jesus by their actions. Some of them were in danger of putting Jesus to an open shame instead of honoring him. Thus, Paul constantly calls the readers to hold fast to the confession of their faith. Um, let's read one of those verses. Let's see. Um, not ashamed of the gospel. This is Second Timothy one eighteen. Uh, I mean one eight and twelve. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner but share with me in the sufferings of the gospel according to the power of God. For this reason, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have, commi um, what I have committed to him until that day. Um, and then we'll end with Hebrews 13, 12 to 15. Therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Therefore let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For we have no continuing city, um, but we seek one to come. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. So, in, in summary, um, Christ, being that Christ was not ashamed to call us his brothers, uh, we have to also be willing to suffer shame for being associated with Christ, that he himself might confess us before his Father. So we'll, we'll end with that thought that let us remember to always uh, be proud of being Christians and not be afraid of what the world will think. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thanks. And we're going to look at now that Christ was flesh and blood like us. And so... <clears throat> Uh, like I like I said on, on, on the, when we were talking on about Sabbath, it's just always so amazing to me that Christ was willing to take on human nature, and that He would be willing to come and die for us. And we see that in Hebrews. You know, He was higher than the angels, and then He became lower than the angels, and He partook of flesh and blood, and um, so that through death He could destroy. The, the battle that had begun in heaven with, with Satan. And we look at Hebrews, we're going to look at Hebrews 10, 5 through 10. And what's interesting about that, it's the foundation of, of the plan of salvation and um, for, in our hope for eternal life. If you spend some time in early writings, Ellen White talks about when uh, Christ and his father um, concluded the plan of salvation and that he the two of them spoke privately several times and when Christ came out and told the angels they wanted to take his place but he said no this is this is he said basically this is my job and so read early writings it's very it's very enlightening but anyway we're right now we're going to look at Hebrews 10 5 through 10 Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. But then I said, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book that is written of me to do your will, O God. So Christ was doing God's will in removing sin from this earth. Previously saying, sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings of sin, you did not, did not desire, nor do you have pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. By that we have been sacrificed 
through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all, which to me is so beautiful. That, and we've talked about that in earlier lessons, that the animal sacrifices were a foreshadowing of the sacrifice of Christ. Because God doesn't really take pleasure in sacrifice. It's really a righteous life that he, he wants us to uh, bring forth rather than to crucify Christ again. So we're going to look at some of the human deficiencies that Christ had here as flesh and blood. And so um, one of them, we're going to start with Matthew 16, 17. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father is in, who is in heaven. <clears throat> so as a flesh and blood, we cannot understand the things of heaven. And so it's this frailty of our human nature that requires Christ and the Holy Spirit for us to really reveal spiritual things and heavenly things to us. Galatians 1.16, to reveal his Son in me, that I might preach among the Gentiles. I did not immediately confirm with flesh and blood. <clears throat> so we see here in, for, in Galatians a lack of understanding. And oftentimes we as humans have a lack of understanding. There's been so many situations I've been in where I've had a lack of understanding, and I'm sure you've experienced that as well. In 1 Corinthians 15.50, Now... This I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. So because of this, the sinfulness, we're subject to death. Ephesians, and, and so was Christ. Christ was subject to all of these, these things. Ephesians 6, 12, For we do not wrestle with flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts, and wickedness, is in, wickedness in heavenly places. <clears throat> so our battle is not with this earth. Our battle is not with the circumstances of this earth, and our battle is not with human beings. And I, I have to admit that this is one of my biggest struggles, is to realize when I'm in the midst of the battle, when I'm praying <clears throat> to God for assistance, when there's a problem with a relationship with someone, that the battle is not with them. The battle is with these rulers of darkness. Hebrews also says, however, that Jesus was different from us regarding sin. First, he did not commit sin. Commit sin. Uh, second, we say that in Hebrews 4.15. Second, Jesus had a human nature that was wholly innocent, unsustained, separated from sinners. Thirdly, <clears throat> We have all sinned, and we have evil tendencies. Our bondage to sin begins deep inside our very own nature. We are carnal and sold under sin. And then fourthly is pride. And our other self-motivations often taint even our good actions. Jesus' nature, however, was not marred by sin. It had to be this way. If Jesus had been carnal, and sold under sin like us, he would have also needed a Savior. Instead, he became our Savior. So if, if Christ had fallen, had had blemish, been with blemish, he would have needed um, um, a Savior as well, but he didn't, did he? And then finally, Jesus destroyed the power of the devil by dying as the sinless offering for our sins, thus making it possible our forgiveness and reconciliation to God. <clears throat> and so um, we see this in Hebrews 4.17. Inasmuch then as children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power over sin, which is the devil, and we read that in our memory verse, and release those who through fear were <clears throat> all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful, faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for sin. 
Jesus broke the power of sin by giving power to live a righteous life through the fulfillment of the new covenant to right the law in our hearts. Jesus has defeated the enemy and effectively liberated us so that we can now serve a living God. And we look forward to <clears throat> um, this, the, this final, and I, I had said this early on, I'm looking forward to saying this final destruction. And we see that in, 11, in Revelation 20, 1 to 3 and 10. <clears throat> then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that old serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him, so that he could deceive the nations no more until the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a while. And then verse 10, the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are. And they were tormented day and night forever and ever. And so we see that this Christ being willing <clears throat> to be flesh and blood like us, to conquer sin for us, became our Savior. Amen. Wayne. Thank you so much for that, Barbara. I'll tell you, that was um, really resonated with me with the comment that you made about um, the battle with the rulers of darkness. So many times I think we, we tend to forget that, that, mm -hmm. you know, some of the people that we might deal with in our lives, that they're really not, you know, they're not our enemy. We've only got one enemy. So that certainly is encouraging. So Wednesday's lesson, I will talk, the title of the lesson is Perfected Through Sufferings. So Jesus perfected through sufferings. Let me ask you all a question at home. So when we think about Jesus perfected, um, how can Jesus be more perfect. I thought Jesus was already perfect. Many people ask me that question sometimes. Well, I thought Jesus was perfect. How can he be, how can he be perfected through sufferings? Well, let's see what the Bible has to say. In Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 10, here's what the Bible says. It says, for it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto the glory of to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. I like how the Bible describes this. Um, many of us believe that it was Paul that wrote uh, Hebrews, um, but most theologians agree we really don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews. But I, I like how it articulates this in the beginning of verse 10. For it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, Obviously, this is talking about Jesus, the second person of the Godhead, that he was the uh, uh, creator of all things and of whom of all things are, that are in existence that, are, that do exist. Uh, but it talks about um, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. And so when we look at Jesus' suffering, the purpose of Jesus' suffering is, is multifold. One that, that he can identify with us. He can identify with me. He can identify with Wayne's weaknesses. He can identify with our loss. He can identify with our pain that we have in our life because as, as Jesus suffered, we suffer too. The Bible also tells us that all who live godly will suffer some sort of persecution. So anytime we have a life like Jesus, we also will suffer too. And then in verse 10, in verse 17, it says, Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that's us, that he might be merciful and, faith, and a faithful high priest in the things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. And so here, this is so beautifully manifested when we think about the heavenly sanctuary, Jesus, our high priest. There is no priest here on earth. Our high priest is in heaven, and that person is no other than Jesus Christ. And so when we look at this high priest that we have in heaven, because of his sufferings and because he can identify with us, that makes him more fitting to be, um, uh, more fitting, uh, to be perfect through his sacrifice. The lesson articulates it this way, that Jesus was perfected in the sense that he was equipped to be our 
Savior. So he was perfected in the sense that he was equipped to be our Savior. And so when we think about that, when we think about his love for us and how he's able to identify with our pain, with our loss, that's what equips him to be perfect. Let's look at verse 18 as well. It says here in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 18, in verse 18, the Bible reads, For in that he himself hath suffered, being tempted, he is able to secure them that are tempted. So he knows what it's like to be tempted, just like we're tempted. He can identify with us. He can identify with our joys. He can identify, identify with our pains. He can certainly identify with our sorrows. Lesson also brings this out too, that Jesus learned obedience through sufferings. Obedience was necessary for two main things, two main things. One, obedience made his sacrifice acceptable. And so when we think about, uh, when we think about sacrifice, when we think about what's acceptable to God, um, God wants our obedience. Uh, so many times I think, you know, we, we, we think that the Bible might be filled with rules, um, but when the Holy Spirit talks to us, we realize that the Bible is really actually filled with, with, with love and with acceptance and with forgiveness and with patience and with grace that we see, uh, uh, that, that we see throughout the scriptures. But Jesus ex also expects us to be obedient and he can equip us to be obedient because we don't have the power to do so without him. And so we'll look at um, also a couple other verses in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 8 and 9. I want us to see this so we can home in on something. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 8 and 9. Here's what the Bible says. It says, though he were a son, and that's capital S-O-N, second person of the Godhead. Though he were a son, yet learned he, learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all of them that obey him. So being made perfect, meaning his salvific, that's what the word that theologians typically use, that his salvific purpose became perfect. And it says here in verse 9, uh, the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. And so here we can see the under, we can see the understanding of, of Jesus, his, his, his salvific purpose for us um, as it's manifested through his sufferings. From sovereignty and dominion to submission and obedience, that was Jesus. From sovereignty and dominion in heaven to submission and and obedience. He gave us an example of how to live our lives through suffering. I want to share something with you um, before I close out Wednesday's lesson. Many times we, we wonder in our lives, why do we have to suffer? And many times people ask this question, why do bad things happen to good people? You know, a lot of times when I'm at the hospital, as I make my rounds, I'll speak with families and they will, you know, they'll look at their loved ones that's in the hospital and their, hosp and their, and their loved ones are, are suffering. Um, they see the medical challenges that they're dealing with. And especially during COVID-19, many of them, many of the patients can't, you know, they're having a difficult time breathing. And when we think about the, the suffering that, that, the, that patients go through in the hospital, I try to encourage many of the families, but the biggest overarching thing that they, they tell me is they want their loved ones to be able to take just one more breath, just one more breath. And I want to pause it to you. I want to ask you a question this morning when we think about this, our, our lesson study today. How bad do we want our next breath when we think of Jesus as our kinsman redeemer, but also when we think about the suffering there's one thing that I noticed in the hospital, I'll share it with you as I close, and that is that there's a peace that some of the patients have 
a peace that passes all understanding, a peace that even though they might be struggling with taking that next breath, I've noticed in many patients, there's a peace that they have. And this is the peace that even though we might suffer, even though we might suffer, that Jesus is always with us and he'll never forsake us and he'll never leave us alone. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) Actually, that's a perfect transition to Jesus, our example. This is the brother as a model. This is um, Thursday lesson, January 20th. Um, And so you, you hit upon something very key, and I think that the key to Thursday's lessons began on Wednesday, which is that um, Christ had to suffer and be perfected through suffering, that he might be an example to us. Um, my, my version of God is that as God in heaven, he cannot be tempted to do wrong. So God is so powerful that he, I mean, what are you going to bribe him with? He's like, I own the universe. Um, there's really nothing God could use from anybody that would ever tempt him. So in order for him to be our example, he had to let go of his divinity so that he, he would be suffer, partaker of suffering in becoming like us. Because as God, he couldn't suffer, nor could he be tempted. So he, he would never do wrong just because he's God. But as a human, he could do wrong. Um, so let, let's read uh, a little bit here from Hebrews 12, 1 to 4. Uh, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that it set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Um, And then, let's see. In this passage, Jesus is the culmination of a long list of characters whom the apostles um, provides as exemplars of faith. This passage calls Jesus the founder and perfecter of our faith, which is the Greek word archaeogos, um, or that is founder, or can also be translated as pioneer. So Jesus is the pioneer of the race in the sense that he runs ahead of the believers. And it it also, Hebrews 6.20 also calls him our forerunner. Um, So again, it says in Hebrews 2.13, I will put my trust in him. And again, here am I and the children whom God has given me. What is happening here is that Jesus said he would put his trust in God. This reference is an allusion also to Isaiah 8, 17, and 18. So let's, let's read on that. Um, and I will wait on the Lord who hides his face from the house of Jacob, and I will hope in him. Here am I and the children whom the Lord has given me, We are uh, for signs and wonders in Israel, for the Lord of hosts who dwells in Mount Zion. Um, And then there's an interesting reference that's brought in here, which is to um, the prophecy in Isaiah with regard to King Ahaz. So um, I'm not going to read the entire 2 Kings 16, 5 through 18, I'm just going to summarize it as, um, in this, Ahaz decides that he would rather have Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria, be his, his father and his... Uh, so, so he says to him, I am your, your servant and your son. Come up and save me from the hand of the king of Syria and from the hand of the king of Israel who rise up against me. Uh, and so Ahaz gave him a bunch of gold and silver from God's house and so forth. So the, the point is, is that Ahaz was a bad example, so he showed what a lack of faith would look like. On the other hand, um, the prophecy of Isaiah talked about Emmanuel, the Emmanuel part of the prophecy, who was Jesus himself, who showed us what 
Ahaz should have been like. Um, and so he says, Moreover, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, saying, Ask for yourself from the Lord your God, uh, as, from Lord your God, ask it either in the depth or in the height of above. Um, so God was willing to still give Ahaz a sign, and since he uh, didn't ask for one, then he gave him the Messiah as, as the sign, which is the, the most important sign in the entire Bible. Um, so it says here, uh, Jesus, however, put his trust in God and in his promise that he would put his enemies under his feet. God has made the same promise to us, and we need to believe him just as Jesus did. And that comes from Romans 16.20, which it says, And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. And the, the other verse that was already mentioned that I wanted to talk about again was um, the one about making your enemies your footstool. Let me see, where was that one? Um, and that was Hebrews 1.13. But to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool? So I think that part is, is actually for us as well, that since we are considered Christ's brethren, that we are to follow his example in this regard as well, so that rather than us trying to fight our enemies, um, we are to let God fight our enemies. Um, and in fact... I think there was a beautiful example, which I didn't um, quote here, but there was a story in the Old Testament where um, one of the kings of Israel, instead of um, pre preparing for war when, when he felt like he couldn't win against the enemies, he actually sent the choir ahead of the army, and they, they went ahead singing, and by the time the king with his army actually got there. The enemies of God had slaughtered each other to the point that there was no fighting he needed to do at all. And I think this was one of the prophecies given by Elisha uh, to this king uh, about how that was going to go down. And so I think the teaching, sit until I make your enemies your footstool, applied to Christ, but it also applies to us that we are to um, sit and wait on God to destroy our enemies because, well, number one, we can't destroy our enemies, but number two, if we tried, I think it would stain us, whereas like God himself cannot be stained by um, destruction of the wicked. So, therefore, I think the lesson of being willing to sit until God's time should reveal um, how he's going to uh, make us conquer over our enemies. And I wanted to also end here with a quote from the Acts of the Apostles. Um, the Apostle Paul felt a deep responsibility for those converted under his labors. Above all things, he longed um, that they should be faithful, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. He trembled for the result of his ministry. He felt that even his own salvation might be imperiled if he should fail of fulfilling his duty to the church, um, his duty, and the church should fail of cooperating with him in the work of saving souls. He knew that the preaching alone would not suffice to educate the believers to hold forth the word of life. He knew that line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, they must be taught to advance the work of Christ. It is a universal principle that whenever one refuses to use his God-given powers, these powers decay and perish. Truth that is not lived, that is not imparted, loses its life-giving power and its healing virtue. Hence, the apostles fear that he might fail of presenting every man perfect in Christ. Paul's hope 
of heaven grew dim when he contemplated uh, any failure on his part would result in giving the church the mold of the human instead of the divine. His knowledge, his eloquence, his miracles, his view of the eternal scenes when he was caught up to the third heaven, all would be unavailing if through unfaithfulness his work uh, in his work for those whom he labored should fail of the grace of God. And so, by a word of his mouth and letter, he pleaded with those who had accepted Christ to pursue a course that would enable them to be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life. Every true minister feels a heavy responsibility for the spiritual advancement of the believers entrusted to his care, a longing desire that they shall be laborers together with God. He realizes that upon the faithful performance of his God-given work depends in a large degree the well-being of the church. Earnestly and untiringly, he seeks to inspire the believers with a desire to win souls for Christ, remembering that every addition to the church should be one more agency for the carrying out of the plan of redemption. The end. The end. All right. Thank you, Scott. Anything? Anything else? No. Uh, I think that, that that's that was, a, that was a good. good. Good part to that end on. That was good. Wayne, do you have any final thoughts? You know, my final thought when I think about Sunday's lesson and Wednesday's lesson is I think about this text. One of my favorite texts that says. As the deer panteth at the water brook, mm -hmm. so, O oh my soul, panteth after thee, O oh God. And that's something that David wrote um, as I think about that text and as I think about this quote from Desire of Ages, closer than father, mother, brother, friend, or lover, spouse, is the Lord our Savior. And how bad do we want that, that kinsman redeemer? Um, almost as if how bad do we want that to take our next breath? And so when I think about that, um, that, this, this, uh, that text and, and these quotes, it really resonates with me, Sunday's lesson and Wednesday's lesson, um, because Jesus wants so bad to be our brother um, as, a re, as a redeemer. Yeah. Thank you. So, and as I look at, at the, the lesson this week, I, I think about Christ as our brother, what he gave up to be our brother. When he came to this earth, his focus was on, wasn't on, okay, how much money can I make? How many houses can I have? How many kids am I going to have? Am I going to find a wife? None of these things that we focus on our time on was he thinking about his time was here for us and so if our goal is to be with him where should our focus be and it needs to be on heaven and I was looking at um, from councils and parents and teachers something that Ellen White said our souls are to be surrounded by the atmosphere of heaven and when our souls are surrounded by the atmosphere of heaven, we're going to have that peace that Wayne talked about when, that, that he sees in some of his patients. Men and women are to watch themselves. They're to be constantly on guard, allowing no word or act that would cause their good to be evil <clears throat> spoken of. He who professes to be a follower of Christ is to watch himself, keeping himself pure and undefiled in thought, word, and deed. His influence upon others is to be uplifting. His life is to reflect the bright beams of the sun of righteousness. There is need <clears throat> that much time be spent in secret prayer, in close communion with God. Now, we've just finished 10 days of prayer. Um, last week, we finished 10 days of prayer, where we talked about um, the importance of prayer, how to pray, and the tools to use to pray. So... 
if, if you haven't had a chance to watch that, I'm going to put a plug in here. Go back and watch the 10 Days of Prayer. You can watch it on, on, on video. Thus only can victories be won. So it's through this time in secret prayer, this time in com close communication with God, can we win these victories. These victories that we think we need to fix ourselves, Christ will win for us that, that battle against flesh and blood. Eternal vigilance is the price of safety. So Amen. let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we're so thankful that you were willing to be our brother. We're willing, Lord, to put our lives in your lap, put our lives de dedicated and devoted to you, Lord. As we conclude this lesson today, we just thank you that your spirit was with us, that your word was open, and that um, your love shone through in every word that was spoken here tonight. So, Lord, we pray that we, you, we take away those things that you would have us to take, those things that help us understand you better, those things that show your glory, those things that reflect your character, Lord. May they be within us. May they transform us. And maybe we'd be willing to fight with vigilance in prayer those things that need to happen on this earth. So thank you for hearing our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath.